Good morning, everyone. My name is Neil Stone. I'm from the Centre for Global Health at St George's, University of London. I'm going to talk to you this morning about how we perform a lumbar puncture, and some of the reasons we do it, and the best way to perform it safely and effectively. So the aims of this talk is to make you aware of the indications and contraindications for, for performing a lumbar puncture, to be aware of the equipment necessary to perform the lumbar puncture, to understand how we measure cerebrospinal fluid pressure, and to be aware of the possible complications of the procedure. So first of all, we'll talk about the indications and why you would perform a lumbar puncture. So particularly in the context of cryptococcal meningitis, it's an absolutely crucial test. We can sample the cerebrospinal fluid and we can use this to check the cryptococcal antigen to give us a diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis. We can measure the protein and the glucose of the sample, as well as get a cell count, which will give us a strong indication of what the diagnosis might be when we suspect cryptococcal or any other kind of meningitis. We can also use this to culture the organism if it is indeed positive for cryptococcus or another pathogen such as tuberculosis or a bacteria. We can use this fluid to actually grow the organism in the laboratory, which will guide our therapy. And the second reason, beyond the diagnostic value of doing the procedure, something which is particularly critical in cryptococcal meningitis is its therapeutic benefit. So we can actually reduce intracranial hypertension, which is a very common complication of cryptococcal meningitis. And then we can use the lumbar puncture to reduce the intracranial pressure by removing cerebrospinal fluid. There are some contraindications for lumbar puncture, although they're rarely encountered. So we would not perform a lumbar puncture if there was an infected skin over the needle entry site. However, this is uncommon. Suspected cerebral space occupying lesion. This is something which we could rule out if we are strongly suspected by imaging the brain, particularly with a CT of the head, if this test is available. Or a brain abscess might be another reason for not doing a lumbar puncture. Another contraindication we might come across is coagulopathy, particularly a very low platelet count, less than 20, or if the patient is on anticoagulant therapy such as warfarin. However, these are rarely encountered and it is overwhelmingly safe to perform their procedure in suspected meningitis. Now I'm going to just present the equipment we require to safely and effectively perform the procedure in a sterile manner. So we have an example here of a pre-prepared lumbar puncture pack, which is sometimes available. If this is not available, you can gather each of the items required individually and create your equipment for the procedure. So we require a sterile dressing and sterile gloves and a sterile drape. Asepsis should be followed as much as possible during the lumbar puncture. Antiseptic solution for cleaning the skin and local anaesthetic, most commonly used is 1% lidocaine, otherwise known as lignocaine. We need syringes and needles for introducing the local anaesthetic, as well as the spinal needle itself. We often use either a 20 or a 22 gauge needle. Either is absolutely adequate for the procedure in most patients. And very importantly, we need to use a manometer. This is what we're going to use to measure the cerebrospinal fluid pressure. And we need our test tubes for collecting our samples. They can be simple plastic universal containers without any added reagent, as long as they are sterile and have a cap to close it so we don't lose the sample. So I'm going to explain how we perform the procedure itself. So first of all, as with any procedure, we should explain what we're going to do to the patient and get their consent. Verbal consent is adequate. We don't normally require written consent for the procedure. As I previously mentioned, asepsis is absolutely critical as we don't want to introduce any infection at the site of the lumbar puncture. Local anaesthetic is, is very beneficial for the patient and should always be used where available because it reduces the pain encountered by the patient during the procedure. Then it's important to find our landmarks. What we would start by doing is palpate the iliac crests and draw an imaginary line between the two. This is the level of the L4, L5 intervertebral space. And this is a very safe place to perform the lumbar puncture because it's below the level of the spinal cord. We can go as high as L2 or 3 if that's the easiest to palpate vertebral space. However, no higher because of the risk of actually causing any damage to the spinal cord, although very rare. It is far preferable to go below this point. Then we would use our lumbar puncture needle 
after local anaesthetic is introduced and slowly introduce the needle, normally feeling a slight give as we access through the ligament and slowly re removing the needle each time until we have a clear flow of cerebrospinal fluid. At this point, we would add our manometer, which is assembled using a three-way stopcock. We would then close the manometer to allow the fluid to gradually rise up the manometer. Don't read this measurement until the fluid has stopped rising completely. When it does, this will give you your opening pressure, measured in centimetres of H2O. We can then open the manometer and use that to collect our sample. Collect at least 10 drops of CSF in each of the four test tubes. In most patients with cryptococcal meningitis, it's safe to remove large volumes. Even up to 20 or 30 mils of fluid is safe in these patients. At the end of the procedure, apply a sterile dressing at the site of the puncture. Normally, patients are placed in the supine position at the end of the procedure, as this may reduce post lumbar puncture headache, although there's limited evidence for this. We do normally recommend it. Don't forget also that it's also important to draw a serum glucose from the patient, as we, we need this to compare the serum with the CSF glucose, as the ratio between the two is important in trying to make a diagnosis of suspected meningitis. I'm going to talk more about measuring CSF opening pressure, as this is a very critical component of managing patients with raised intracranial pressure caused by cryptococcal meningitis. So the normal CSF pressure is usually between 10 and 20 centimeters of water. So anything above 20, and certainly above 25, would be considered abnormal. And this is commonly encountered in patients with severe cryptococcal meningitis. It's very important to measure the opening pressure when the patient is in the lateral recumbent, recumbent position. As having the patient sitting up, as is sometimes done when performing LPs, we do not get a reliable measurement of opening pressure. As I previously mentioned, the way to measure the pressure is to attach the manometer via the stopcock after you've removed the needle and you have a steady flow of CSF. The height of the fluid must only be measured when it stops rising up the tube. Sometimes this requires some patients as the fluid will continue to rise slowly. However, it's important to wait until this is completely stopped to get a true opening pressure measurement. The patient position can also affect the pressure, so it's important to keep the patient as steady as possible whilst taking the pressure. As well as measuring, measuring the opening pressure, it's also important to measure the closing pressure and record this, especially when removing large volumes of CSF. This is simply done by replacing the manometer at the end of the procedure and taking another measurement before removing the needle to complete the procedure. This will give us the closing pressure, which can also be recorded. We would aim for a pressure of 20 or below in patients with cryptococcal meningitis. And we can use the manometer to very accurately and safely do this by repeated measurement of the CSF opening pressure until we have removed enough fluid to return the opening pressure to a normal reading of 20 or below. I mentioned sample collection and the tubes we need. The asepsis is important, as we don't want any contamination in the laboratory when we send our samples. Specimens should also be taken to the lab as promptly as possible in order to get the most accurate readings, as leaving a sample sitting out for a long time can increase the risk of contamination and false readings. We normally recommend four sterile tubes, as there are a number of tests which are required when we suspect cryptococcal meningitis in a patient. And it's preferable to have enough samples for the laboratory as we don't wish to repeat the procedure unnecessarily. We have uh, given examples here of the, of the samples which can be taken and what tests can be used in each. So for the four tubes, we want to have enough sample to measure, as previously mentioned, the cryptococcal antigen, protein and glucose, Indian ink, which is a stain for visualizing cryptococcal organisms in the CSF, gram stain looking for bacterial species, culture and sensitivity for growing the organism and getting a sensitivity test. Cell count differential is very important in the diagnosis of suspected meningitis. And it's always worth saving an extra sample. As we often have to repeat tests, samples can be contaminated or lost, and it is always worth having an extra set by for any other test you may wish to use. For example, testing for tuberculosis, which may be in your differential. I'm going to talk about the complications of lumbar puncture. 
Complications are rare and the procedure is overwhelmingly done safely without any major complications and is of benefit for the patient, both therapeutically and diagnostically. However, there are complications. The most common one is a post-spinal puncture headache, which occurs in anything up to 70% of patients. However, in patients with cryptococcal meningitis, they usually present with a headache, which is relieved by the procedure. So this is a rarer side effect in this population. Other complications include a bloody tap, often if one of the veins is accidentally accessed during the procedure, a dry tap when no fluid is encountered, infection from performing the technique uh, in a manner which is not aseptic, hemorrhage, dysesthesia, and postural puncture cerebral herniation are extremely rare complications which are very unlikely to be encountered if we have adequately assessed this risk before performing the procedure. As I mentioned, a post-lumbar puncture headache, it's, it is relatively common, although less so in this particular population. And it's caused by an ongoing leakage of CSF from the puncture site. And it normally occurs within one or two days of the procedure. It's almost always self-limiting. Traditionally, this was uh, the aim was to prevent this by having the patient lying in the supine position, or there is limited evidence this, this actually makes any difference in preventing post-lumbar puncture headache. Usually resolves on its own or with, with simple analgesia. So just to finish up now and summarize, and some of the recommendations we would make to anyone or any health care facility who are likely to come across patients with suspected meningitis, including cryptococcal meningitis. One of the main issues is access to the equipment. It's absolutely vital that any healthcare facility which will be receiving patients with potential meningitis has access to this equipment, particularly manometers. Most of the equipment is very easy to come by, although manometers are often difficult to access. And it's very important that these are available. Adequate training is absolutely essential. So again, any healthcare worker who will be seeing patients in whom they suspect meningitis must be able to perform this procedure confidently, safely, and effectively. Crucially, lumbar punctures and cryptococcal meningitis are not only diagnostic, but are an essential part of treatment. Lumbar punctures should be performed as often as needed to keep the pressure below 20 centimeters of water. In some cases, this might be required every day at the beginning of treatment. And it's very important that this is done as often as is needed because this is a, a crucial part of treatment can actually can actually influence the outcome of the patient. And following on from that, manometers must be used. In some centres where a manometer is not available, healthcare workers try and guess the intracranial pressure simply by looking at the speed with which, with, with which the fluid comes out and drips out. However, this is very unreliable and cannot be used as a measure of intracranial pressure. Therefore, manometers are absolutely essential. That completes my talk today, and I hope it's been informative. Thank you.